This video will identify the tactics of the interviewer Stahl and Trump. It's exciting to observe the power struggle between the two until the dramatic climax. Politics is full of deception, which is why entire books have been written about tactics and strategies. Journalism is an area in which simplification unfortunately thrives. The lack of nuances and focus on sensationalism often taint the way we perceive the world. In a lot of ways, politics and journalism are two sides of the same coin, and they're mutually dependent. Let's see what happens when the two sides collide. Let me know what you think about this interview in the comments below. Are you ready for some tough <clears throat> questions? You're going to be fair. Are you go be, I'm going to be fair. Just be fair. But you're okay with some tough questions? No, I'm not. I mean, you're not I'm, okay with tough I questions? I want him to be fair. You, you don't ask Biden tough questions. So. Trump was asked a dichotomy question, but he answers with an implicit command that Stahl be fair. This is the first conversational sign that Trump isn't going to be cooperative. The lack of cooperation is emphasized when Stahl repeats the point about tough questions and Trump says no. The laughter is common when the other speaker doesn't conform to the question format that's laid out. This initial lack of cooperation is unusual in political interviews. In political interviews, the interviewer's aim is not just to obtain information, but to ask the politician to account for his words and actions. Therefore, interviewers' questions often embody assumptions that reject the politician's stated positions. Stahl does reject Trump's positions later on, but right from the beginning, Trump puts the pressure on her. The interview hasn't even started, but the power struggle has. Let me ask you what you think your, uh, the biggest domestic priority is for you right now. Uh, well, or next ultimately, year. Let, let me, and I, I'll tell you, it was happening. We created the greatest economy in the history of our country, and the other side you was know that in. You know that's not true. It is totally true. No. Trump was asked about his priorities. This is a presupposition question, presupposing that he has a priority. His answer isn't specific, it's a roundabout answer, meaning that he'll either get to the answer eventually, or get cut off before he does. Here he gets cut off in a so-called insert expansion. Insert expansions occur in the middle of a so-called first pair part and second pair part. Insert expansions interrupt the conversational flow and often end up in arguing, as we see here. Like all politicians, Trump is more focused on his own achievements his own agenda with the interview. Interviewers know this, so they look for any opportunity to interrupt. According to the standards of political interviews, interviewers are supposed to be the agenda-setting party. That's why in the following, Stahl interrupts Trump and calls him back to her agenda, so that he answers within her frame. We had the best stock market price ever, and we're getting close to that price again. Virtually every number was the best. And what was happening is things were coming well, together. Well, I asked you, what's the priority? I mean, those are all the you, good things. The what do you have to solve? The priority now is to get back to normal. Well, Stahl treats you, Trump's priority? roundabout answer as evasive, which is what interviewers is often do. And finally, the textbooks would say, Trump engages in lexical reuse, which is expected in political interviews. Through this practice, politicians can propose that they're attending to the question in detail and are thus properly responsive to the issue that the question raises. This is important in order to be considered reliable. Trump's resistance against Stahl separates him from most politicians. Most politicians strive to be on good terms with the interviewer. They know that the interviewer is an advocate for the average critical viewer. Thus, even though their answers might be unqualified, putting on a show of politeness is important to most politicians. From what we've seen so far and what we're about to see, Trump's resistance stems from him feeling personally attacked. Stahl continues to elicit an emotional reaction from Trump. She does so with ridicule, which Trump senses immediately. Okay, let me, let me ask you something about suburban women. Yeah. Suburban women, will you please like me? Remember? Please, please. You said the other day, to suburban women. Will you please like me? Please, please. Oh, I didn't say that. You know, that's so misleading the way. You, see, the way you said that yeah. is why people think of you and everyone else as fake news. The way you have it, it's like, oh, like I'm begging. I, I'm kidding. Play it. And I'm kidding. That is such a misleading question, Leslie. 
It took Stahl five seconds to make a statement, and Trump takes 40 seconds to deny it. This discrepancy shows his pre-existing resentment of these interviews. While many politicians would have cooperated in a playful tone, phony or not, Trump does not. He dismisses the so-called illocutionary force in her statement. In isolation, Stahl's statement is called a locution, the statement or question itself. But the illocutionary force, the way she says it, is ridiculing. And knowing journalists and knowing the research they do, I'll argue that the perlocutionary force of the illocution is to get Trump riled up. Perlocutions are about getting someone to do something as a result of the illocution. As such, Trump's lashing out on the news media was bound to happen at some point. He says that her type of question is why people think of her and everybody else, as he hyperbolically states, as fake news. Obviously, this is association. Association suggests that you're not alone in having a certain opinion. More importantly though, it's a reference to the community that Trump built around the notion of so-called fake news. Therefore, Trump's statement runs deeper than simply association. This reference to a community is constitutive rhetoric. It's where the speaker creates a collective identity that viewers ideally identify themselves with. It's where the speaker quote-unquote forces a self-understanding upon the viewers in order to get them to do something or believe something, in this case that the news media are supposedly fake. All politicians do this to get their target audience to feel sad, upset, or scared, whatever's needed. This kind of rhetoric is also evident when Trump makes it about stall in her profession. We've done a good job. We've done maybe a great job. What we haven't done a good job on is convincing people like you, because you're really quite impossible to convince, but that's okay. And the economy now is coming back, and it's coming back very strongly. And people see that, Leslie. Trump underlines the supposed discrepancy between journalists and citizens, and us and them discourse. He says that people see that it's going great, which then, in theory, invalidates Stahl's skepticism as a journalist. Now let's return to the passage with Trump saying please. Stahl was unsuccessful in interrupting Trump, and she's slowly losing the power struggle. To get the power back, she introduces split hunting. Split hunting is the interviewer proving or making it sound like the politician contradicts his own policies or colleagues. Um, you promised that there was going to be a new health package, a health care plan. Yeah. Um, you said that it was going to be great. You said it's ready. It's going to it be ready. Be. It'll be here in two weeks. It's going to be like nothing you've ever seen before. And of course, we haven't seen it. So why didn't you develop a health plan? It is developed. This is called complex preface. Complex prefaces are characterized by several problematizing statements leading up to the question itself. Here, she tries with split hunting again and tries to make Trump's comments sound not only hyperbolic, but also deceptive. Like Trump, she uses association in form of the personal pronoun we, preceded by the adverb of, of call, course we haven't seen which it. is an appeal to alleged shared knowledge. Thus, this so preface why? is loaded with presuppositions, and so is the why question she ends up asking. Presuppositions are powerful in that they assume agreement about what's right and wrong, and unsurprisingly, Trump opposes this presupposition. It is fully developed. It's going to be announced very when? soon when we see what happens with Obamacare. Stahl introduces a faux question, a preliminary question designed to get to another question, the real question. Experienced politicians sense this immediately. Stahl asks if Trump can characterize his supporters. Yeah, I think I can. People that love our country more than anything else, and they like to see our country thrive. But do you think that when you hold rallies and encourage people to say, lock her up, the way you... I don't encourage them. They say it. And you Hillary enjoy Clinton. it. You don't say, don't say, do Hillary that. Hillary Clinton deleted, she deleted 33,000 emails. They say it. It starts... It, you it encourage ends up being it. A, I don't encourage it. Yes, you no. do. The real question, on this case, opinion that Stahl wanted to get to, was the perceived problem with the supporters. And she's generalizing these supporters. Stahl's verb encourage is a presupposition, which Trump interestingly reacts to by rationalizing the problems he sees with Hillary. 
With this rationalization, he himself reveals that he's very far from opposing what his supporters were shouting. Stoll continues with another presupposition question, a question where you have to agree with the premise in order to answer. The question is about personal responsibility, but Trump answers using association. Do you take any responsibility for the country being divided against itself? Do you feel that? I'd like not to, but, you know, perhaps everybody has to take a little responsibility for it. But when people put out phony witch hunts, you know, when they spy on your campaign, you have to fight back. The conjunction but, which emphasizes the following about phony witch hunts, further minimizes the original question and makes it about what he's had to endure instead. In the following, the tension that's been present since the very beginning is about to culminate dramatically. Do you know what you told me a long time ago when I asked why you keep saying fake yeah, media? Yeah. You said to me, I say that because I need to dis uh, discredit you so that when you say negative things about me, no one will believe you. I don't you. have to discredit you. But that's what you You've told me. You've discredited yourself. Your first statement was, are you ready for tough questions? Are you? That's no way to talk. It's no way to talk. I think we have enough of an interview here, Hope. Okay, that's enough. Let's go. I'll see you in a little while. Thanks. Be careful. The objective question remains. Was Trump too touchy and personal? Or was Stahl deceptive and or too personal in her questioning techniques? It's not my job to answer this question. Instead, I recommend this video if you want to know more about the discourses that indirectly control our daily conversations and also interviews like these. Link is in the description.